always been thought that violence and corruption during elections in Nigeria are homegrown problems, ones that Britain tried hard to prevent by bequeathing a system of fair and honest democracy before granting the country independence in 1960. We are not kids. We are mature people, and the country is a mature. We are giants of Africa. But according to our document, the unpublished memoirs of a former British colonial officer, London's parting gift was, in reality, a lesson in how to rig the polls and deceive the people. This is a story of evil committed by kind, nice, decent British politicians. They sought to keep Britain from bankruptcy and found a solution in the mineral-rich empire on the point of independence. It was necessary to bend the rules, and sadly, in due course, the rules were... In 1956, Nigerian children sang to welcome the Queen as she toured some of their country's new democratic institutions. And in January 1960, on his way to South Africa to make his famous speech, warning that a wind of change was blowing through the continent, the British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, stopped off in Lagos to give the Nigerian Parliament some pearls of wisdom from the world's longest-standing democracy. So long as we value the freedom of speech, freedom to express our opinions, I know of no better system than a fairly elected parliament for giving people the sort of government they want. Those who got in the way were innocent, like the colonial peoples, but both had to be dealt with quite harshly. Back in the 1950s, Harold Smith, an idealistic young Oxford graduate, was settling into life as a British colonial official in the Nigerian capital Lagos with his wife Carol and their young daughter. Important regional elections were to be held that year, followed by a national poll three years later, just ahead of independence. Harold had his part to play in the preparations, drawing up new laws aimed at ensuring that Britain left Nigeria an orderly and stable place. But his faith in the integrity of the project was soon to be shattered. In 1956, I was in Lagos on the staff of the Ministry of Labour when I received the secret file, which had a, a minute, which ordered me to get involved in the regional elections which were taking place. It told me to take all the vehicles of the Ministry of Labour, all the staff, the clerical staff, and as many senior staff as I could find, to act on behalf of the minister. And the chap was called Festus Okote Ibo, and carry out the minister's the appointing minister's instructions and get his party colleagues elected. Festus was a flamboyant political figure who'd been appointed Minister of Labour. He was also treasurer of one of Nigeria's main political parties, the NCNC, which had its power base in the east. Harold Smith says he was shocked to be asked to interfere in the election on behalf of the NCNC candidates standing for seats in the minister's constituency. To have cars and trucks in the bush at all gave you tremendous prestige. All people had were bikes. If a fleet of vehicles with a, maybe 30 or 40 staff of clerks and administrators had suddenly descended, they'd have made a very big impact. As it, this was official, this was government stuff. Why did the British want you to help ensure that this, this man, or at least his colleagues were elected because the plan was to put the north in government in power the elections were just to be fixed a very serious accusation that britain which advertised its withdrawal from empire as a model of fairness and democracy was allegedly rigging or at the very least giving advantage to a favored party in the polls can such an allegation be substantiated I took Mr Smith's claims to the director of the Centre of African Studies at Oxford University, Professor David Anderson. In the 1950s, virtually all the British colonies were moving towards independence in Africa, and there were elections taking place everywhere. It would not be unfair to say that in 
almost every single colony, the British attempted to manipulate the result to their advantage. Indeed, it would be surprising if, if, as the colonial power, they'd not done so. At this time, Nigeria was divided into three regions, each with distinct and often conflicting tribal and cultural identities. Partition was a very real threat, and given their experiences in India, something the British were determined to avoid. Traditionally, the colonial power had enjoyed a close relationship with the largely Islamic north of Nigeria. This part of the country was more conservative and less developed than the rest. Here, the British operated a system of indirect rule, governing through the local emirs. Professor David Anderson. The north of Nigeria was not only largely Islamic, it was deeply conservative. And therefore, it was uh, ideologically going to oppose the pan-Africanism and internationalism that tended to mark southern politics in Nigeria. So for sure, the British saw the north as an important bulwark against what they might have termed unnecessary radicalism. And the fear of radical political ideas, in other words communism, was key to British policy in Africa in the 1950s. Communism was thought of as a very serious threat in West Africa because the kind of socialism it fed upon in Africa was driven by massive poverty and very low levels of education. Therefore, British analysts at the time thought West African populations were vulnerable to communism. In order to ensure that, come independence, their interests would be represented by their conservative friends in the north, the British had virtually created and strongly backed a political party for the region, the NPC but it could not hope to win enough votes nationally to win outright. So the British needed to ensure that they had the support of either the Eastern or Western parties. This would explain why Harold Smith claims he was ordered to divert resources to help candidates standing for the Party of the East, the NCNC, led by one of the founding fathers of Nigerian nationalism, Dr. Azikwe, also known as Zik. They had to fix Zik, and of course... There was stuff they could have got him for, sent him to prison, but they didn't. He was forced to do a deal with the North. This great nationalist had to do a deal with these illiterate peasants in the North, and that's what happened. Whatever the true motives of the British administration, to this day, Harold Smith is adamant that the order to interfere with the elections came from the highest authority in the colony, the Governor-General himself, Sir James Robertson. Recorded here during the royal visit in 1956. <clears throat> to the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, I have the honour to offer to Your Majesty and to His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, our most loyal welcome, and to express our deep and sincere appreciation of your gracious presence today. He was a thug, and he had a terrible reputation, Robertson. He wasn't talking about people when he talked about Africans. They weren't people, they weren't human beings. We loved Africa. But these people who came in to do this job were a different breed. These were the ex-SOE and MI6, and they thought that they were really tough. And they were. Smith claims several of his colleagues were also asked to interfere in the elections, and they reluctantly fell in line, leaving him alone in his refusal to obey Robertson's orders. Isolated but still defiant, he was finally granted an audience with his boss at Government House. I go up and I see him. And the first thing he says, I want you to know that everything that you've alleged about the elections is correct. I'm telling you this because you know far too much and I want you to know how much trouble you're in. The colonial service is just like the army. You know what happens if you disobey orders and active service and that's what's going to happen to you. I thought, I was shot. And this big guy. I was so angry that I really wouldn't have been surprised if he pulled out a pistol and shot me. 
a huge you know array of files here. Are these all your correspondence yeah. on the side? In the spare room of Harold and Carol Smith's home, piles of paperwork fill a large metal filing cabinet, much of it copies of unanswered letters to the great and the good, detailing Harold's allegations. Doing this for many years... With no recordings of the conversations he claims took place and no copies of the orders he says he was given, he's unable to prove the serious claims he's making. The Smiths have fought a long, lonely and largely fruitless battle to have his story heard, but with nothing on paper and all those who could back up his story dead, why should anyone believe him? His wife, Carol. You're quite right. We have not got written evidence and things we can say, there you are. Well, I know Harold's telling the truth. You either believe us or you don't. What makes you so convinced that Harold isn't mistaken on this? I've known him, I've been married to him 55 years. I know what he's like. I know the sort of person he is. I know the sort of values he holds. I don't think I would have had the courage to do what he's done. But at least I've had the courage to stay and support him in what he's doing. Most of the people were elected unopposed because they tended to arrest the opposition to exile them and beat them up and sometimes even kill them if they if they kept pushing their luck. Academic and novelist Patrick Wilmot taught sociology at Amadou Bello University in Nigeria for 18 years. He believes Smith's allegations expose only a small part of the lengths British colonial officials were prepared to go to in the north in an effort to ensure that Britain's favoured party, the NPC, got elected unopposed. The British were in control. The so-called native authority, the emirs, the local police, all of that was under British uh, control and supervision. These people, they could have been removed, they could have been stopped at any time, but they were actually encouraged because the British wanted to hand over to them and they wanted them to control the northern region, which was the most powerful region in the country. But you'd imagine that a government may have official control of an area, but it wouldn't always know what exactly people are doing on the ground in terms of the sort of thuggery you're talking about. The British were completely aware because they had their officials at every level, in the police, the security services, they had control of the army. The key thing was to prevent people from running against you. What evidence do you have for these allegations? No, these are not allegations. If you go to Nigeria, everybody from the professors in the university to the people in the streets will tell you that this has happened. I mean, there are history books written, but most of these history books will not have the sort of knowledge that people who will talk to you in Nigeria have. Time to look for answers in Nigeria, then. Children play behind the reformed Christian Church of God in a Rima town in southern Nigeria, outside the home of a man who's been part of the struggle for freedom and democracy in Nigeria all his life. I am Comrade Che I Ibegura. I am now 74 years old. I'll be clocking 75 on November 16 this year. On the walls are pictures of the leaders of Nigeria's independence movement, as well as a poster of his namesake, the Cuban revolutionary Che Guevara. In the 1950s, when Nigeria was still under British rule, he was a trade union leader and a member of Dr. Azikwe's NCNC, with strong opinions about the real intentions of the colonial power. By 1956, I was 24 years old. So as at that time, I was an activist. I started to draw political inspiration when I was about 20. You see, I'm from a Christian background and believed in justice. And I knew quite well that the intention was not to develop us. Che Bigura believes that Nigeria's first democratic elections were far from free and fair under British rule, and that little has changed since they left. Nigerians just got what was already on ground from the British. They started operating from what they saw. Whatever we are trying to experience from Nigeria now was the structure laid down by the British. Harold Smith's claims that he was asked by the country's governor to help ensure that a favoured candidate was elected fits with Che's memory of those early Nigerian elections. Money was flowing to the north. 
both from the British government, uh, you know, the supporters from the British angle and from the Arab world. No master has ever given his slave the opportunity to rival him. Nigeria is a British baby. They can't just allow Nigeria to play their hands freely. Otherwise, why are they colonial masters? I've been looking through the papers of some of those colonial masters to see what they were prepared to say about their motives and their methods when it came to Nigeria's first elections. And they make interesting reading, like this letter from one Sir Peter Smithers. I was parliamentary private secretary of the colonial office through almost the whole period of decolonization. I was present at most of the negotiations for independence, including that of Nigeria. A secret agent, MP and diplomat, Sir Peter was a dashing figure, rumoured to be the model for Ian Fleming's James Bond. And in this letter, he details his part in the shaping of independent Nigeria, and he makes a frank admission about British attitudes to the leaders in the north, the Kano rulers. The attraction of the Kano rulers was that they had long and successful experience of government. They therefore offered an obvious choice to head the new experiment. It was, in fact, difficult at the time to see an alternative for the early stages of independence. Sir Peter died last year at the age of 92. Sir James Robinson, the Governor-General of Nigeria at independence, and the man Harold Smith alleges ordered him to interfere with the electoral process, died in 1983. But again, his memoirs suggest that he did not always play by the rules. Recalling Nigeria's first general election in 1959, he writes that before all the counting had finished, rumours began to circulate that the NCNC from the east and the action group in the west were getting together and might form a coalition. Now, this would be a disaster for Britain's hopes of the Northern Party, the NPC, taking power. Sir James was alarmed to discover that even though there were a number of seats still to be declared, if the Action Group and the NCNC formed a coalition, they would have a majority in the House of Representatives. I believe this could be very dangerous for Nigeria's future. As from all I'd learned of the Northerners, they might well decide to leave the Federation, for they would not readily accept a national government of Southern parties. According to Sir James, as Governor-General under the Constitution, he was required to appoint as Prime Minister the person who seemed to him most likely to command a majority in the House of Representatives. In his opinion, even though the count was not yet over, this was the Northern leader, Abu Bakr, and so, after a brief discussion, he invited him to form a government. And I did so on the grounds that the leader of the party with the greatest number of seats was surely most likely to be able to form a government which would win the support of the House. As far as I remember now, I took this action entirely on my own and did not consult the Secretary of State, for the matter was urgent and could not wait. So, by his own admission, Sir James Robertson was determined to see the North in control at independence and was prepared to bend the rules to achieve this. But were the British prepared to go as far as interfering in the voting process itself? If so, how was this done? There are those who believe the British had laid the foundations for the electoral success of the North years before by falsifying the results of a national census. Professor David Anderson. In the 1950s, it was certainly to the advantage of the British to do, as you've described, to increase the population of the North because it would shift the relative balance of power in the Assembly. The suggestion that the British were anything other than impartial arbitrators of Nigeria's independence is not popular with veterans of the colonial service, like Gerald Summerhays, who worked in Nigeria from 1952 to 1981, starting out as an assistant district officer before rising to permanent secretary of a ministry in the north. He's adamant that neither he nor anyone he worked with interfered in any way with local elections held in his area, though he does remember talk that the census had been fiddled. Well, there was various allegations going on. There was one which I remember featuring in a newspaper alleging that a, a village of 5,000 people had been discovered in one area which had not been counted previously. Well, that sounded, shall we say, a trifle unlikely. The more general allegations were that parts of districts were counted twice, uh, 
and allegations were made that this was done. I have no knowledge where it was or not. The only place I do know where it wasn't done is where I was dealing with it. How likely do you think it is that this happened in the North? The answer is no. Out of the question. Why is that? Because it was controlled by the British administration, and the British administration would not have done that. Well, it's the British administration that's being accused of collaborating with local people to ensure that was done for, for Britain's Excellent. own interest. Well, they can accuse it as much as they like, I'm afraid. There's, a, there's so many misleading... It's so easy to uh, make accusations of that type. The only thing I can say that I was actively involved in it, and I knew the other people who were involved in it, and many of them, and I do not believe that one of them, for one moment, it would ever have done anything like this. But you can't Certainly, be sure they didn't, was, can you? You can't be certain of anything, can you, unless you see it yourself. Although, if there had been any involvement of, of that, there would have been some form of policy statements, there would have been some form of suggestions from above that should have been done, and I would have heard that myself, because I don't think for one moment they would have given it just to one or two people. One would have heard it widely. And I did not hear it, and in fact I've been absolutely horrified to the mere th thought of it. It's very difficult to find evidence that elections have been rigged. People tend not to write about these things. If one sees ballot boxes being stuffed, voters being bussed around, if one uncovers fraud on the electoral roll, these are all forms of proof. But the elections in Nigeria in 1959, none of those things were reported. But it seems that finding the evidence is perhaps less of a problem than actually getting my hands on it. Amongst the hundreds of files housed in London's National Archives that cover this period of British rule in Nigeria are two marked closed for 100 years. They deal with the role of both the Governor-General, Sir James Robertson, and the leader of the NCNC, Dr Azikwe, but aren't due to be open to the public for another half a century. I've put in a request under the Freedom of Information Act to view them now, but I'm still awaiting a response, as is Professor David Anderson. Clearly someone in the British government, when those files were classified, didn't want us historians to know something about what they contain. And that raises my suspicions that those files might contain information about whatever deals were brokered between the British government and the NCNC because it is certainly the case that the NCNC could not have won the election support it did without British support, or nor that it could have formed a coalition with the MPC at independence without British support. So I would love to see what's in those two files about Sir James Robertson and Dr Rizikwe. Nigeria gained its independence from Britain on October the 1st, 1960. It's a very touching moment as the Union Jack is brought down in darkness and the Nigerian flag is gradually taking its place. Whether engineered by the British or not, as the Union flag came down, the North was in the driving seat. The leader of the NPC, Abu Bakar Tafawa Balewa, was Prime Minister. His coalition partner, Dr. Azikwe, took the role of Governor-General and later President. And on the morning of Nigerian independence, greetings to you all, fellow countrymen. The deed has been done. It is finished. And but hopes for Nigeria's future were soon to be dashed. Continued tensions between the three regions, exacerbated by the dominance of the North, contributed to the political instability that led to a coup, a counter-coup, and, within seven years, the Biafran Civil War that cost the lives of as many as three million Nigerians, largely through starvation and disease. In his memoirs, Harold Smith records the fate of their cook and their nanny caught up in the chaos. Grace and William worked for us and we trusted them and treated them as friends. We loved them. We left Africa and were very worried for them. Nigeria was on the brink of freedom and independence. They believed it because they trusted the British. They were Commonwealth citizens and our Queen was their Queen. We know that their trust was misplaced. The British had betrayed them. William's body, his human remains, first rested in a ditch in Biafra.
before being consumed by the teeming animal life in the bush. Grey Sarnani starved to death in her native village in Biafra with her small children. These unresolved events of so long ago seem to have cost Harold Smith a great deal, both in terms of his health and peace of mind. But he's adamant that over the years they've cost Nigeria a lot more than that. I mean, so many coups, so many assassinations, so many murders, mm. so many thousands killed. All those people in the oil regions have cheated and treated so dreadfully. I mean, no country has gone through 50 years of absolute bloody hell, and it's all due to the British. Harold, it, it, it seems surprising, though, that the Nigerians, particularly the Nigerians, would need any help in rigging elections. I mean, these days we hear no, that's nothing... No, not true. That's not true. Nothing but rigging that's of elections. True. Look, we're the ones who rigged the elections. We're the ones who gave this example. If, we, if they ever needed lessons, but we, we did video. every dirty trick in the book, and we did it in Nigeria. They didn't do it. Mm. We could say, oh, you can't trust them. The way they spoke about them in London, oh, they're children. So you believe then that we taught them all they knew? Yes. Yes, we've destroyed democracy in Africa. It's deeply frustrating that although the testimonies of Smith and many Nigerians suggest that Britain's gift of democracy was not quite as history records, it's still impossible to be sure. Yet Professor David Anderson believes the government could easily end the mystery by finally agreeing to open the two long secret files. Well, Mike, you and I will be long dead by the time that these documents become available. And frankly, I think it is farcical that the British government should be able to do this. Uh, f for one thing, it, it undermines trust between our country and a former colony, Nigeria. And for another thing, it raises deep suspicions about British actions and intent. I really think these files ought to be released as soon as possible so we can find out what's in them.